All right, everybody, welcome back to the best hour of the day. Fern here, and I'm here again. We've, uh, we've done some weekend podcasts, and I wanted to get uh, this individual on here because of obviously everything that's going on. But uh, I'm here with Dave Kalina, who is the founder CEO of O2 Recovery. Is that correct? Is that the actual? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So most of you have probably seen the, this drink in your gyms, um, but they're doing something. Uh, they've partnered with Born Primitive. So if you haven't heard that podcast with Bear, please go back and listen to that. But they are doing some really, really cool stuff for the affiliate. I am obviously an affiliate owner and Jay and I do everything that we do for the affiliates. So I wanted to bring Dave on and, and talk about that. And luckily we had some mutual friends. It was a quick connection. So um, we were before we hit record, I was talking to Dave about his life and basically he works nine days a week. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time, man. So thank you because we're pleasure. recording this on a Sunday. So um, first and foremost, man, I'm not going to hold it against you. I was looking at your bio on LinkedIn and I saw you went to the Ohio state university. I, did. I, yeah. did. So. I appreciate the, the V in front of there. Well, done. <laughs> yeah. well, my wife's from Ohio. I'm an LSU fan through and through. So, uh, um, where's your wife from? Uh, she's from Cleveland. So like okay. Fairview, yeah, Fairview park right outside of there. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so, um, but yeah, let's, uh, you know, obviously, um, I want to know about the company cause I'm always curious about like how you got to where you are now. Um, yeah. So if anybody had, it doesn't know what O2 is, I mean, I'm sure it's, you guys are newer to the space, but it's not, it's not like you guys didn't start yesterday. So mm-hmm. um, give us kind of the short and short about wh- where you guys started and how you got to where you are today. For sure. So about, um, man, it's been a long, it's been a long journey, so to speak. But um, about 10 years ago, I was working a kind of a traditional day job. I was in corporate strategy at a company called Nationwide Insurance in Columbus. And I, was, I wasn't I was doing CrossFit yet, but I was doing kind of like my own high intensity interval training. Um, so I was pretty active. I was working, you know, pretty long hours during the day. And then I, I actually cut my entrepreneurial teeth um, as a founding member of a private charter high school in Columbus called Cristo Rey. So that was basically my night job. And you were teaching was, there or I wasn't teaching there. No, I, 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 I helped start the school. Okay. Um, which is probably a, a, a longer story in and of itself. <laughs> um, but I, I, I was fortunate to work for somebody at nationwide who was, who was pretty high up in the company he reported the CEO there. Um, and he, over the course of the first few years of my career became, you know, a mentor to me and, and we became very, very tight. And he was on the founding board of the first one of these schools in Chicago called Cristo Rey. And that was in 1996. And not to get us too far off the, off the path here, but. That's but what podcasts are for, man. Yeah, man. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Completely diverting. Um, so the, the, the school was, was founded on the premise of getting, getting really high quality education to, a, to a, a, a group of underprivileged youth. So economically disadvantaged. Um, students and it's it's a it's a high school model so nine through twelve and the way high high quality education whether it's private or public is expensive right mm-hmm. and so the way that that this uh, that this school got off the ground and got off the ground to such a magnificent start in in Chicago was they basically went into the lowest income one of the lowest income neighborhoods in Chicago and hired a bunch of really, really fantastic teachers. And the way that they paid for that education was that each student would share a, like an entry level administrative job at a local company. So like a JP Morgan or, you know, Boston Consulting Group or whatever, just pushing papers. And four students would share one job. And in return for that labor, so one student would work Monday, another work Tuesday, another work Wednesday, so on. And in return for that labor, the job would basically give them about $30,000 collectively to apply towards their tuition. And so, so the school started to, started to gain a lot of momentum because they were in a neighborhood that was graduating probably you know, 30 40% high school graduation rates. And Cristo Ray, then and now today, fast forward almost 30 years, graduates 99% of, of students from high school. That's and, incredible. and not only that, they also go on, most of them go on to graduate uh, college too. And so I first heard the story of, of sort of Steve, my boss's founding story about Christo Ray. Um, and it inspired me to really look into the model even closer. And in 1999, Bill and Melinda Gates got involved and, and blew out the expansion of this school. So 
when I, I started looking at this in 2009-ish, um, there were already about 20, 25 schools across the country. And one of them was in Cleveland, where your wife's from, super mm -hmm. close. Um, and that school's been around for probably almost 20 years now. There was another school that's now established in Cincinnati, but there wasn't one in Columbus. Okay. And at the time, probably still currently, but certainly at the time, Columbus, where, where we lived, was, was the only growing city in Ohio. And so I approached Steve one day. I'm like, hey, man, you know, you helped start this magnificent school in Chicago mm -hmm. uh, about 15 years ago. And there's one in Cleveland, uh, you know, up north. There's one coming to Cincinnati down south. We got to do one here in Columbus, you know. And so in, in typical high profile executive fashion, it's like, okay, I'll help you as long as you do all the work. I'm like, all right, fine. <laughs> smart so, man, know, smart I was man. 25 at the time, so I didn't have anything else to do. Um, and so this became largely my night job. And so over the course of the following year or so, I was really burning all candles at all ends. You know, I had a pretty active social life. I was pretty active, you know, physically. I was pretty active in my day job. I was pretty active in my night job. And I found myself drinking a tremendous amount of Red Bull and Gatorade. And so I was like, all right, this is, you know, this is somewhat sustainable because I'm in my mid twenties, but this probably isn't a great long-term thing to be doing. You know, um, and I, I didn't come. Yeah, when you, when you turn the can of Red Bull around, you're like, mm, I don't know if that's good <laughs> yeah, long-term. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so I had made uh, close friends with a, a physician, a guy who was fin finishing up his medical residency at Ohio State's hospital from the Krista Ray project. He, he was on, he was on a team that I put together to throw a big fundraiser. And so he was of a similar age, similar lifestyle. And one day I asked him, I'm like, what do you, you know, surely you, you lead this active lifestyle too. Surely you're not drinking this, you know, neon garbage in the form of, you know, sports and energy drinks. What do you do, Dan? And he's like, well, actually I just, you know, I drink that neon garbage and feel bad about it. And so, so we're both like, well, shit, you know, if you do this and I do this and we both feel bad about it, we both know better, but we can't find anything else. We should just make our own drink. Like, mm -hmm. how hard can that be? We'll be overnight billionaires. Right? <laughs> that was that, So you beat me to the segue. And then my second <laughs> question is, how does somebody decide? Because that is a, that's an industry where me personally, I'm like, absolutely not. Like, I, I'm not even going to try. Yeah, you, like, you, to you've got that. a lot of wise common sense. <laughs> 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 we did not. And, and, and so, so, and I think that was part of it too. You know, both of us were, were pretty young, you know, no kids, pretty, pretty you know, pretty stable enough financially to be able to afford to take some risks, you know? And so um, we're like, let's just make our own drink. Like, let's, you know, let's see what that looks like. Um, so we originally set out to effectively build on better mousetraps. So combine what we liked about sports and energy drinks with, yep. you know, all the stuff that we didn't like. And then around 2010, maybe it was 2011, Dan, the doctor came across some really compelling medical research that showed the accelerating effects of ingested oxygen on your liver's metabolism of toxins and pace of recovery. So I came, I was coming from a corporate strategy background and I was already kind of mm -hmm. looking for something to hang our hat on about how to make this, you know, unique and different. I'm like, that's it. Like nobody's making an oxygenated drink. That's yep. super, super cool. And we can do something special with that. Let's make that the, the core of our product. And that's when, you know, O2, as we know it today, really was born. Little did we know, there, there are many, many reasons nobody was making an oxygenated <laughs> drink. And it's, it's really hard to make an oxygenated drink, you know. But so I know most no people idea. know, I know people, most people know carbonated. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, I mean, again, I'm going to, I'm going to illustrate my ignorance here. What's the difference between obviously with the exception of carbon versus yeah, 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 you yeah, know, yeah. oxygen, like why is it so much more difficult? No, it's, a it's a great question. So, so if you're looking at it from the common sense perspective, which, which you are, which we were, it was like, all right, we can just, instead of carbonating something, we'll oxygenate something. So just swap out the, the tank of, of, of CO2 and swap in a tank of O2. And that's effective. That's right. That's correct. That's basically how that works. But at an industrial level, at scale, it's just way, way, way more challenging okay. to, than, than, you know, in practice than it is in theory. And it has to do with, you know, the way that, that, that uh, production lines are set up and speed and efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so so we, didn't, we didn't know anything about that world at the time. And if we did, I can almost guarantee you, we, you and I would not be having this conversation. <laughs> like I would have moved on to something else a long time ago, probably. Hey, but, sometimes ignorance is bliss and it's best that way. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, but that became, that became like our thing. And so I left my, 
I left my day job at the end of 2011. I had already started uh, training pretty intensively in a type of mixed martial arts and self-defense called Krav Maga. Yep. So I, I started to coach Krav in 2012, and that's what got me into CrossFit. The Krav gym that I was coaching at also uh, had CrossFit. And so after you know a year or so of being like, those, those guys are crazy in the CrossFit room while everybody in the crowd room is just punching each other in the face all day i was like all right i'll give it i'll give it a shot um and so i i started i started doing crossfit in 2012 and then i became i did my first l1 in 2013 and started coaching all while trying to get this you know this business somewhat off the ground because mm -hmm. it's easy to take an idea and talk about an idea but it's a, it's a whole lot harder to to take an idea put it into practice as you know right actually yeah. building something as everybody listening to this knows, you know, you look back on your journey, you're like, man, I remember when I when I first thought, yeah, this will be, yeah, it's pretty straightforward, right? This will be easy. I can open up a gym or I can open, you know, create a beverage brand. And then you're like, oh my God, I didn't know shit. Like this is this is way harder than I thought. You know? So how long from idea to market? Do you remember? Really from yeah. So so we did a so 2010 was idea. We did a little kind of a, a, a test pilot in Columbus where we rented out some space in the back of a commercial kitchen and we couldn't get anyone, you know, in, in the beverage industry to talk to us because we were two guys who had no idea what they were doing saying, oh, we want to make an oxygenated drink, you know, and anybody in the industry has been trained to keep oxygen out of beverages for as long as they've been in the industry. And, and that's also we a weird, that's also like a weird, very a mafia like industry as well. It, it is, man. It's pretty tight knit. It's hard to break into, you know, it's, 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 there's definitely, there, there's a there there. In terms yeah, yeah, of, for of sure. Commodities. <laughs> um, but, and we were, we were not in it at all. You know, I like neither of us came from any sort of backgrounds that, that would lend itself easily into entering this industry and neither of us came from you know any sort of financially wealthy backgrounds either like both of our parents were middle class growing up and that's how we work so so we didn't have a ton of money laying around to sort of buy our way into the industry either so so we first started um we rented out some space in the back of a commercial kitchen in the short north in columbus and that allowed us to basically do our own like do our own concoction and put it in a bottle and and see if people would pay for it and and the drink was it was in this glass bottle and we made it out of a like we we bought bought ingredients on amazon and got a got a used bar gun from a restaurant supply company and swapped out a tank of co2 for a tank of you know somewhat illegally procured oxygen i'll let you figure out how we got that um and started bottling this drink if nobody's and, following there's a doctor on the team so <laughs> yeah, right. who shall remain anonymous um so we started we started bottling this this drink that tasted god awful i mean the the universal feedback was this tastes terrible but man this really works really really well and so, 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 you know, first we started selling to our friends and then friends of friends, and then, you know, got a couple of stores to pick it up and we were selling at five bucks a bottle and the, it, it was pulling oh, wow. through, okay. it was pulling through. And so at that point, you know, we hadn't, I think Dan and I both invested like $5,000 into, you know, the equipment and everything else. And so we were very, very little, you know, little investment outside of our time. And, uh, and so at that point, once we start to see people are willing to, to pay for this terrible tasting drink that works so well, that's when I knew, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go all in on this. And so I did. So I, I had, I'd set aside, you know, I had some savings from my time at Nationwide. Um, I had a, a nice 401k that, that is long gone at this point. Um, and so I set aside the remaining amount of, of money that I had accrued and, and into an actual, you know, an, an actual production run of an actual beverage. Um, so I spent about six months writing a business plan. I got some other people, um, who had served as various mentors to me over the course of my career to invest. And we did a, we did a full production run in 2014 was the first, was the first production run. So, so we kind of dipped, years, our, got it. Yeah, dipped, okay. dipped our toes in the water in 2011 and then 2012 back to the drawing board, 2013 business plan, investing, uh, and then 20 finding a co-packer 2014 was get it off the ground. Oh, um, wow. okay. Yeah. So it was a long time, man. It was a long time. And I, I still feel like, you know, only, only somewhat recently did we really truly kind of launch mm -hmm. because the first few years, I mean, the first year was literally and figuratively 
out of the back of my car. You know, I was doing, yeah. I was doing everything. I was doing the, you know, I was doing the sales. I was doing the deliveries. You know, a lot of people who are still O2, O2 resellers today. Um, remember when I used to drop off O2 at the CrossFit gym, you know, at the back of my, back of my car. Um, and, and, and the intention was like, let's, let's get really, really close to all facets of the business and let's figure out what works and what doesn't work. And before we, before we go out and raise, you know, a bunch of money and spend a bunch more of other people's time on this, let's make sure, cause we're going to screw up. Right. And yeah. we did, I made every mistake in the book. Um, but let's make sure we do that on a small scale before we really go pedal to the metal and, and all out. And I'd, I'd say that, you know, that first kind of test and learn, test and learn phase of the business was probably about a three, three year, you know, endeavor. And I'd say only, only somewhat recently, let's call it 2017, did we really truly figure out, you know, what it is that we have, how to, how to market it, how to reach people efficiently, effectively, you know, the type of people that we work with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the, all those like really, really important things, you know, it took us, it took us three or four years to figure that stuff out. Yeah. I can imagine. Cause you're, you're simultaneously trying to figure out your product while mm-hmm. trying to figure out how to pitch it and how to position 100%. it in the market. Yeah. That's, that's totally. tough. Totally. The, totally. So how did you guys, I mean, obviously you were, was, uh, was your partner, was he in the CrossFit space as he, well? He was not. No, he was okay. not. Um, Dan, Dan, the doctor is, is still Dan, the doctor. He never left his day job. Yeah. Um, he, he has since gotten super, super into, uh, like extremely long distance running, like the type okay. of shit that, you know, I, as a CrossFitter would, would fear tremendously. <laughs> like, um, like three miles as though you yeah, yeah, exactly, CrossFit. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like even worse than Murph, man. Um, <laughs> so, so he does, I think recently he did like a 60 mile trail race, something like that. Um, but, but he's, he's heavy into fitness too and nutrition and wellness, obviously, but he never got super into CrossFit. So I asked that because if I'm thinking about launching a product, particularly a recovery drink, mm-hmm. I, I can't imagine, but I'd be curious your thoughts. I would imagine there's there's bigger, better industries to potentially launch into than CrossFit. So I guess two questions: Was that your target, and then was that where you started, or did you start somewhere else? Great, great question. That I would love to tell you that the the you know O2 and the our, our CrossFit following was all part of my master plan from the outset. <laughs> but that would be a bold faced lie. That was all a completely happy accident. Okay. The, the way that that happened. So I mentioned earlier. I started coaching CrossFit in, in 2013. So, you know, as, as you know, as, as, as a coach and somebody who's entrenched in that scene, it's a pretty tight knit scene, right? Mm-hmm. And so you get to know and you train with people who go off to start their own gym and you get to know, you know, other gym owners just from being a coach in that scene. And so by the time the business launched, you know, I'd been in that scene for a few years and had a bunch of friends in the Columbus community who either, you know, ran gyms themselves or coached at a gym um, and so in 2014, when we first did our, our first production run, um, I had, I don't know, let, let's call it 30 pallets of product that nobody had ever heard of before mm-hmm. to, that I was single-handedly responsible for selling before it expired. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, so I was like, I, this is, I'm just going to sell it out of my car to anyone who's going to buy it. Like it's yeah. not going to be a rhyme or reason. Let's just throw, you know, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. Um, and I quickly called on a few friends to, you know, to see if they would, they would stock it at their gyms and they did. Um, and initially it was just a favor to me, which I'm forever grateful for, but it, it started to sell and it started to sell really, really well. And so as the guy doing all the, all the deliveries, I quickly realized that it would take me just as much time to drive to our warehouse and pick up 10 cases of product and drop it off at CrossFit Grandview mm-hmm. as it would drive to our warehouse, pick up two cases of product and drop it off at a convenience store or, you know, some mom and pop gym or like a co-op and, and all those retailers would sell through in about two or three weeks. So my, the return on my time was clearly with the CrossFit gym that would sell 10 cases in two or three weeks versus, you know, the convenience store that would sell two cases in two or three weeks. And as one guy all became about where do I spend my time? to be most effective for the business. Well, I imagine a lot of that has to do with just pure competition. I mean, if you go to reach, if I go to a convenience store, I have to compete with every brand in that refrigerator mm, where, sure. you know, CrossFit gym, you might have three. You know? For sure. A hundred percent. That's a huge part of it. That's a huge part of it. And, and, you know, CrossFitters, there's a reason this works so well. I think there are many reasons this has worked so well. 
and it, but it's got it start it has to start with authenticity mm -hmm. like you if Gatorade or you know Coke or some brand that had no business being in CrossFit no tie in to CrossFit tried to break in good fucking luck you know it's just it's not never gonna, gonna work it's, like it's, it's never gonna work it's gonna be rejected so quickly it's not yeah. even funny the, it's right? the the CrossFit in the CrossFit ecosystem has this really intriguing uh, like bullshit filter where For sure where if you come in there and you try to sell some bullshit like you that's it you're done like 100%. you're never making it back into the space because everybody's like no that's garbage which is uh 100%. which is great you know um so that's that's really interesting and i would agree with you if anybody ever tried to break in there uh at least on the nutrition side apparel is a little bit different but mm -hmm. you know it, at least in something in that recovery side like nobody's buying yeah. crap and and, you know? and we we take our you know we take pretty seriously what we put inside our bodies it's like we're paying, yeah. you know, 150, 200 bucks a month to go and be tortured for yeah. an hour a day. <laughs> and so, so I want to get the most return out of that investment too. So you're yeah. damn right. I'm reading labels and that's, that's our, that's always been pretty good for O2 because we've always had a very, very clean label. And so, you know, that, that element was very beneficial from the outset. The fact that I was a coach was very beneficial from the outset. The fact that you're only competing with two or three other products at most gyms, is very beneficial from the outset. And the brand loyalty is huge, you know, and that's, that's, I think part of what brings us, you know, to this conversation today is that community is so tight knit and yeah. it's, it's so brand loyal and it's so down to help other businesses, whether it's a beverage brand or a local affiliate or somebody trying to get something off the ground and CrossFit, mm -hmm. that community's down, man. That ecosystem yeah. is a very, very supportive ecosystem. And so that's been, that has literally been the foundation of our business since day one is, has been that, found, that, that, that ecosystem. That's really cool. And because I was talking to, to Bear about this a little bit in the, in the, in the other podcast, but I, I was thinking about, I think Reebok might be the only brand that's prevalent within the, the CrossFit ecosystem that wasn't born out of a CrossFitter or their garage mm -hmm. or something like that, mm -hmm. which is yep. really, really intriguing. It, it's just yeah. that I like to describe as it, it's a, it, like CrossFit and the ecosystem is like a self licking ice cream cone. Like it just, it just yeah. everything that everybody needs was sprung out of that, you know, like yeah. software systems, websites, totally. consulting, apparel, all that stuff. And it's really, really totally. cool. Cause it's always, it's all basically like for Chris CrossFitters by CrossFitters, which totally a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And e even with Reebok too, I mean, I, I, you know, I've never, I've never spent time validating this, this assumption, but, but my assumption is when, when Reebok and CrossFit got pretty, pretty tight, there were some, some pretty, cr some pretty powerful CrossFitters at Reebok who, who, you know, built that relationship. Oh, that's, that's that was, still the case today. I mean, I, yeah. I've spent a decent amount of time at Reebok and, and the people there are crossfitters you know the people for that are sure. designing the nanos sure. and the shorts sure. those guys are in a crossfit class for at sure. noon or nine or six a.m yeah. so it, it's it's definitely uh, and i do know this i do know that reebok from the outset of that relationship really bought into the crossfit ideology like they mm -hmm. they eat sleep and breathe it and you know like totally. you know, denise thomas and austin and james mm -hmm. and, and all of the all of that gang they're all very intimately mm -hmm. intertwined in crossfit reebok one which is in the yep. which is in the reebok headquarters yep. so yeah i mean it's still it wasn't born out of that but they very they very much adopted the lifestyle and it's very yeah. apparent when you go there so it's it's uh it's very cool which kind of leads me to the next piece which is you know, obviously you guys chose to, to dive in and, and, and do what you can here with regard to coronavirus mm -hmm. and helping gyms. Um, but I, I think it's worth noting and kind of in the same light of, that I talked about it with Bear is that it's not an easy, that's not an easy commitment for mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. I, people who are not familiar with like food and beverage, beverage mm -hmm. industry. Like for the most part, it would be what's described as uh, a penny business. Like you're, mm -hmm. you, the margins are not massive. You know, it's not like it's really know, it's, expensive to get into. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, like why? Why? That's the question. You know, like why did you guys decide what to do the that? Hell was I can't, thinking? Yeah, because it can't <laughs> be easy. It can't. It's that's a that's a serious commitment on your yeah. guys' end. Yeah, yeah. This this is gonna sound cheesy, but it's the god honest truth. Um, fundamentally, I think it's just the right thing to do. And, and I am a big believer that, you know, if, if you do the right thing, especially when it's hard to do, especially when there are questions of, you know, does this make financial sense or does this, does this make ethical sense? You do the right thing in those instances, you're going to be rewarded for sure. And it, it may not be tomorrow. It may not be next year, but eventually it's going to come back to you. 
and 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 so selfishly, I, I I think there's an element to it where it just feels good to do the right thing when you know that it's it's gonna it's gonna pay off, and and that's been true every single instance I can look back on in my life, and and probably you know many others too. It's like if you do the right thing, you're gonna get you're gonna get rewarded for it eventually, and even if you don't. It's just, it feels good. Still people the right like, thing to do. People yeah. like helping people. Yeah, a hundred percent, man. And so, you know, we've, we've always been a very, very values driven business because, you know, and uh, maybe not to pick on food and beverage too, too much, but, but there's not a lot. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say of all the different categories that I can think of food and beverage is the most value driven business out there. It's, it's, there's just not a ton of that. In no, food I mean, I can think or, of, I can think of one, you know, only because I'm, I'm pretty intimately familiar with Chick-fil-A, but like, they're the only ones that like, I know that there's a lot of value mm -hmm. and, and brand yeah. and, and like culture within Chick-fil-A. Yeah. And, and that's just because one of my members has owns two of them. So, yeah. um, but, and I get to see behind that and I'm like, wow, I'm like, this is totally different than anything I've yeah, ever experienced. 100%. So like, I, yeah, I would agree with you that, that largely it's, you know, it's about the bottom line. It's about, you know, turn in revenue. Um, so what you guys are doing here is absolutely not the norm, which is cool. And, and, and that's something that, you know, we're, I, I'm very, very proud of that culturally at O2 is, is from, you know, from the outset, it took me about a year to really put my finger on this, but there are three things that have become our, you know, our core values at, at O2, honesty, humility, and hustle. And, and like those it. three things are, it's, that's at the core of everything that we do. Um, and, you know, that when I look at tough decisions or major decisions through the lens of, you know, one or two or three of those, those values, it, it becomes pretty quickly clear what the right thing to do is yeah. and what the right decision is. So when this happened with Corona, virus i mean you know I, I was i started paying attention to it probably mid-february and i started to kind of worry about it late february and then i started to get pretty worried about it in early march and then you know my uh my fiance and i actually canceled our en engagement party that was supposed to be let me check the calendar real quick <laughs> it was uh, it was supposed to be the we'll edit this part out and then yeah, we just pretend you. that you just knew it right <laughs> off the top of your head you're in the other room right now which is, <laughs> hopefully you didn't hear that um it's supposed to be the 14th and, and that's when shit really hit the fan, you know? So are you guys in, week. are you, what, so I don't, I'm not really, I don't know what's going on in Ohio to be honest with you. Like as far as lockdown, like is, got, are you guys in full lockdown. quarantine? Yeah. 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 Um, shelter in place, uh, was, was formally put in place maybe a week or two ago. I think Ohio has been somewhat ahead of the curve too. Um, so, so, you know, Ohio got pretty stringent, um, about things right around the, you know, the, the 14th, 15th of, of March, um, which at this point feels like forever ago. I know. Um, but Ohio got ahead of it. And, and, you know, we started to see a lot of people probably don't, don't know this, but over half of our revenue is from, from our gym business. And that's, that's where we focus. You know, we've, we made the conscious decision to go all in on, on gym business and then really, really double down on it. Mm -hmm. Um, over the course of the last year or so and that's always been the foundation but you know mid 2019 it's like all right forget forget grocery forget direct to consumer you know you can only do so much with a handful of people let's go all in on on gyms because that's how we acquire our customers yeah we, you know we get them at, at where they sweat that's always been the foundation of the business and and it it's 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 become something where that's effectively that's what keeps us going is the the revenue and the retention through our gym business and that has effectively gone from 50 percent of the business to five percent of the business almost overnight you know it's been oh it's been i have no doubt yeah two or three weeks um and so uh, you know i've got i've got a i've got a staff of, of of nine people and we've got expenses and we've got you know we've got cash flow issues like everybody else does um, and so when, when we started to kind of really look at where this was probably headed, it became quickly apparent that we, you know, we had a plan for the worst here. And, and so we, you know, we did, and we pulled back any non-essential spend, um, uh, on, on 95% of things. And, 
and we started to look even closer at, at our expenses and we started to look even closer at what we could do to kind of get in front of this problem. Um, and, you know, I, I, I hope I don't regret it. I, I don't think I will. Um, but, but one thing that we decided that we couldn't do was just sit back and, and do nothing and kind of only focus on O2 and, mm -hmm. and effectively wish our, you know, our, our affiliate partners good luck as they, they ride this out over the next couple months. Um, have your, um, outside of gyms being shut down, ha has all of this affected like distribution lines or is that most of that stuff still intact? Well, so, so O2 has got three primary lines of business. Um, the gym business that we just talked about and then direct to consumer, which has historically been about 25% of business. Okay. And then uh, grocery, which has historically been about 25% okay. of business. So we were fortunate um, the other kind of foundational element of O2 from 2014 when we launched was Whole Foods. And we've been in Whole Foods for, for a long time. Um, and we do really well at Whole Foods. And so we haven't really, you know, there, it's been largely business as, as usual at, at Whole Foods. Has that there's, picked up because of the wrong there's been a, there's That's been what an I figured. Uptick yeah. For sure. Um, which is, has, you know, has, has certainly helped O2 in particular. Um, because it's a shelf stable hydration based product. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know that O2 was developed by a medical doctor and he, he based it, he based the, the hydration elements, the ratio of sodium to potassium and the volume of O2 off of a, a, a standard 500 CC IV bag. And so this oh, is I certainly, didn't know that. yeah, a lot of, a lot of people don't okay. know that. So this is, this has been a, a, a pretty big boon to O2 in grocery. Um, and it's effectively tanked the, the gym business. And this is also, um, we, we've, our direct consumer business has, has soared. I mean, we're up, you know, as of last week, 700% direct That's great. consumer. And it's, it, it is, it, it is great for sure, but I want to make it clear and I'll go on the record saying this. Yeah. It is not just because people are buying more stuff online right now. It has everything to do with the fact that when people buy O2, a gym member buy O2, buys O2 right now, we're sharing 50% of our profits from that sale back to the gym. That's why, that's why gym business is up 700%. Yeah. It's because people really, really like giving back because it feels good to do the right thing. Well, I think it sounds very much like you're doing the exact thing that most gym owners are doing, which is like, hey, I kind of am at a loss here, but let me not focus on me let me focus on, okay, how do we continue to serve our customers even though they're not here? Like you guys are kind of already in the virtual space, if you will, mm -hmm. but it sounds like that's the same mindset as like, we have to do more and we have to kind of revamp our business and how we do this. Um, totally. and, and I would imagine probably potentially at a loss, which, which I think again is part totally. of the reason why I wanted to talk to you guys, because I, I do think that's worth noting because you're doing the right thing and it is mm -hmm. not and it's not necessarily going to benefit you the, the, the balance sheet on the, mm -hmm. on, in the short term, which I think is important yep. to know. And I think that that's why I wanted to talk to you and why I wanted to talk to bear, because yeah. I think that stuff matters. You know, I think people yeah. who are in to support the community uh, should be highlighted. And I think it's really cool what you guys are doing. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and, and I think that it's, you know, I do think that it's the right thing to do. I, I, I do think it's going to pay off too. I think this, this, this is a strong, a strong you can make a strong case for this from a business standpoint mm -hmm. because there are a lot of people who are who are learning about what we're up to who just didn't know o2 was on was on the map 100 percent um but even if it doesn't you know we're helping people and i feel really really good about that so when this first hit we first started seeing our gyms go down you know first voluntary and then mandatory one of the first things that we did was we we set aside a whole bunch of o2 um, to give away to affiliate owners. So, so we've been giving away a 21 day supply of, of free O2 basically in an effort to help keep gym owners hydrated and healthy Damn. at a time where everybody needs hydration. Yeah. And we recognize that gym owners are, I think among the top five most influential people in their members lives. And so our intention has been to keep them hydrated and healthy so they can keep their members hydrated and healthy. So that was that's one of the a, first uh, That's an interesting how did you guys figure that out? Now, now, now my gears are spinning in a whole different way. I, it's, it's, it's a great question. I'd, I'd love to, to reference a study that we did, but we just don't, you know, we, we don't have, we don't have the money. To, <laughs> yeah. To, I'm not to asking for a peer reviewed study, study but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
but, but, but as, as a CrossFitter, you know, myself, my, my, my ears certainly pick up when Patrick tells me to do something or Robin, my, my coach tells yeah. me, you know, to, to eat something different. Um, I, I, I pay attention to what Matt Frazier is doing. I pay attention to what yeah. he is doing, but they're not, I mean, they're, yeah. they're on a different world, man. Yeah. But you know, so they're, they're not super influential to me, but, but my direct, my coach 100% is very influential to me. And, and I've noticed that influence, like we've always worked very, very closely with, with gym owners around, around retail and around how to, you know, how to set that up effectively, how to make the most of it, because it, it can be a big part of a gym owner's business, which is also why we're doing this. We, it's yeah. pretty impossible to keep retail flowing if you're, if you're closed. So we felt we had to figure out a way for gym owners to keep retail going a little bit. That's, um, well, I mean, I've owned a gym for 10 years and I just learned something. So that's good. Or just a, you know, different way to view that. You know, I've, I feel like gym owners do have influence, but I never thought of it in, in, that individual circle of influence, like where I think it's sit. top five, if not it, at easily top 10. Easily, yeah. A hundred percent. No, I would and, agree. I would agree now that you say it that way. Yeah. Um, so, so that, yeah. Yeah. I do have a selfish question uh, because of your background and, and listening to you talk, I would be curious to get your thoughts on. So obviously you have a product that you sell. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. And I, that product is paired with service, obviously, but you have a product um, and your, your background is, um, you said a strategic planning or a corporate strategy, corporate strategy. Sorry. So yeah, corporate strategy. If you owned a gym, how would you apply that skill set to a gym? So this is something that gym owners, I think struggle with Mm -hmm. immensely. And when I say gym owners, I'm largely talking about myself Mm -hmm. is how to position yourself in the market, particularly in a sea of functional fitness, copycats Mm -hmm. and other opportunities that are coming to market which make yep. it harder to survive than it did in 2012 and 2013 yep. when yep. you were the only game in town. Yep. Totally. Um, I, I think, I think that there are many, many things that businesses share in common. Um, there are many things that we don't share in common. Like you're, you're not, thankfully you're not ever going to have to worry about your inventory position um, <laughs> of <laughs> products. Whereas yeah. That's always on my mind. Right. Yeah. Um, but you and I are always going to have to worry about, um, loyalty and retention and maximizing value for for dollars, right? Um, and that's you know if if I were if I were a gym owner right now, um, I'd, I'd be doing I'd be doing the stuff that that O2 is doing mm-hmm. with with you know its gym owners, which is really trying to help them however we possibly can, and and maintaining a tight connection with our with our affiliate owners. Um, you know, providing value however we possibly can. The 21 day supply of O2. And that, by the way, that that's that's open to any affiliate owner. It's not just O2 resellers. It's yeah. anyone while well, supplies are, are still intact. But um, yeah, that's one way. The the 50% of profits thing is another way. Um, you know, we're we're really trying to maintain a tight connection so that when this blows over, we can get back to business as usual. Um, and so, you know, we have, we have many, many, many clients who are handling this, you know, really, really well. Mm -hmm. And we have some that aren't and the ones who, who are doing a really, really solid job at navigating this are, are providing, you know, that same level of high value consultative service to their members just remotely. Um, and, and so, you know, that could take the form of, of zoom workouts that could take the form of you know, one-on-one nutrition consultation. It, it, it could take the form of just text messaging every now and then. How's it going? Tell me about what you've been up to, whatever. Um, There's so many that, ideas floating around right now. I was on a Zoom on call. That. I was on a Zoom call with uh, Coach Glassman and I don't know, 20 other people the other day. And you know, just listening to what people there, what people were getting into. I mean, I stole like five ideas within the first 10 minutes of that phone call. I was like, Oh my God. I was like, Oh, I didn't even think about that. I'm doing that. So I, as, as tough as it is right now, I think scarcity as, as you are well aware breeds innovation. And if you're not paying attention right now, sure. you For are, sure. you are missing a golden opportunity to totally. really try to re, you know, either steal and repurpose ideas or just, you know, piggyback on a different idea. And I think that totally. is, and that's something that, you know, in this really crappy time, to be honest with you, kind of excites me as it probably does any true Dude, blooded 100%, entrepreneur. Man, you know, you're going to see, you're going to see businesses come out of this 
thriving and you're going to business, see businesses come out of this that don't come out of it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I agree with you 100%. And, and the ones that thrive are, are going to be the ones that figure out how do I truly add value in a time of uncertainty and, and crisis? And I, I think that that translates into how can, you know, how can I really double down on the loyalty factor? Because people aren't, you, I mean, you know this, people aren't loyal to a gym. They're loyal mm -hmm. to a coach. They're loyal Correct. to a person. Yep. You know, they're not loyal to a brand. They're loyal to people. And, 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 and that's, that's at least our, our sales approach. Yeah. Um, and so we're really trying to use this as a way to strengthen the relationship that we have with our clients and, and help them and make them stronger too. Because if we all come out of this stronger, everybody's going to win, mm -hmm. you know, and it's going to be the same for affiliates and members, you know, people, people are not, this is not an opportunity, I think, or this is not a situation where, you know, people are, are, are going to a, a abandon CrossFit and big masses because, you know, they can't go into the, to the gym every day. CrossFit doesn't sell equipment. CrossFit sells a lifestyle. CrossFit sells community. And you can, you can do, you can scale 90% of that virtually, mm -hmm. you know, you really can. It's uh, it's interesting. I, I agree. I, I, there's a lot of people who think that there's going to be this massive, massive shift to virtual. And um, I, totally I do, disagree. I, so I disagree as well. I do think that that is going to now become an aspect of this whole, uh -huh. of this whole industry. But to some extent, I mean, I'm just going off of my, you know, data set of one gym, which is my members have probably never sought out human interaction more than they do. Oh, now. hell yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've, you know, again, trying to find the positive in all this, I've spent more time either at other people's houses or people at my house in the past week alone mm -hmm, than I have mm -hmm. in the past year. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think we're just going to see, and this is why I've been really trying to stress to on the podcast to gym owners. I, I think not only are people who are paying attention going to have better connections coming out of this, but I think you're also going to see an influx of people who are yearning to have that interaction totally, totally. because they've been sitting in isolation for a month totally. or two months or whatever it is. So totally, totally. I think, I think if you're not prepared for, you know, a massive influx of people would be like, I really got to get into the gym. I'm just craving interaction and, and, yep. and, and this human connection. And I think, uh, that's, that's the one thing that I think while it is abstract, CrossFit does it better than anybody else. And mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody's been able to recreate it. They have what mm -hmm. they have. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. There's not, you know, not to, not to pick on orange theory or F45, but I, I would be surprised if their coaches were going, you know, house to house, checking in on people and, and hanging out with them and spending so much time with them as, yeah. as, as you are, for example, and on that, unique to CrossFit. Yeah. And on that note, I'm thinking like strategically. So a couple of questions. So, just with regard to how this whole campaign works. So they just go to the website and I know uh, Bear told me you guys generated all the codes, correct? Mm -hmm. So yep. I forget what my code is like recovery three. You can look it up like that, but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so you can, you can go on community, community coalition dot fitness and okay. type in your gym name and it'll populate a code. Okay. And you can use that code. Your members can use that code on our website and they can use it on born primitives website. They can use it on Working Against Gravity's website, and we're working with a few other brands to bring them on board too. Yeah, but but that same code will apply to different brands, and as long as that code is used, if if a brand is in the community coalition, they're they've committed to giving something back. So O2 is giving fifty percent of the profits from from sales back when when that code is used mm -hmm. uh, to to the gym owner of who owns that code. Same with Born Primitive. Working against gravity is donating fifty dollars. Um, so, so there's okay. there's different elements of this, but but the key is have your members use that code because that's the tracking mechanism. That's how yeah. we that's how we you know know who to who who, who to pay what at the end. So of I'm that. thinking about this. So so on that, um, I'm trying to figure out different like strategically. So if I'm a gym owner and I'm like, hey, how do I get? So let's say nobody's ever. I'm trying to think of gym owners who may not have used O2. So mm -hmm. you guys are giving gym owners 21 days supply. If that was me, I'm giving 21 cans away. Like I'm probably going to hand deliver 21 cans mm -hmm. to people. Like I'm not going to drink them obviously. Mm -hmm. And then I'm probably going to get purchases off of that. I would imagine be like, Hey, listen, I just want you guys to try this out. It's free. I wanted to 
bring you this thank you card. Thank you for not canceling yeah. your membership. And here's a gift, by the way. Also, if you buy a case of that, we're going to get 50% of the profits. I'd That's be shocked way. if you didn't get 21 purchases off of that. I, I agree. You know? I agree. And, and I'd be shocked if, if any one of those members ever left your gym voluntarily. Probably. Um, so, so, so I... So I think that's that's a great way. There's a lot of different ways to do this. So how do gym, how do gym owners reach out to you for that? Like for to the code? Yeah. Or, well, not necessarily for oh, the code, for the, but for the yeah, supply. for the yeah, they for can the reach spot. out directly to me, David There you um, go. Or, that's that's or the hustle, guys. Drinko2.com. When the boss man gives you his, yeah, <laughs> his <right>. email. <laughs> um, okay. Um, and so it's Dave at what? Dave at Drink02, and that's the letter O and the number two dot com. Um, I think okay. we're halfway through what the supply that we allocated for that. Okay. Um, but, but that's been, you know, that's been really, really well received. Um, and, and, you know, on top of that has been the whole 50% of profits thing. That's been really well received too. And that's, I feel like that's the least we can do. You know, yeah. We're, we're also, we're also looking at other ways that we can, we can help too. Um, the community coalition was born out of effectively the response that we got from doing our own, the, the 21 day supply thing paired mm-hmm. with our own 50% profit thing. I reached out to bear. He got on board real quick. Um, he recognized that, Hey, you know, both of our brands were built in CrossFit and we, we, we have a moral obligation to pay it forward yeah. in, in an instance like this. Um, same with working against gravity. And so there are other brands that we're trying to pull in who are, are also, you know, being, uh, who are also built in CrossFit and who also have online sales that come from members of gyms. Yeah. And, and so it's a really, really nice ecosystem that we're trying to, to, to generate here. Um, and I saw that CrossFit is doing, I thought, I I think they're getting, they're trying to spin, I don't, I'm sure logistically it's somewhat of a nightmare, but I think they're trying to build basically an online fundraiser, like a competition, in air quotes, uh, basically, I don't know how the mechanics of all that work or, or, or yeah. like how it works, but I mean, you know, it, it's interesting that a lot of people poo poo on CrossFit because it's not a franchise. Um, but I think in times like this, you realize that there is tremendous value in this, that self licking ice cream cone that I've described mm-hmm. because all these people come out of the woodwork and realize that mm-hmm. like, if this thing's die, if this thing dies, we all die. Like you, totally. you can't let that happen. So I think it's, uh, it's refreshing to see quite frankly. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. Well, listen, brother, um, thank you for what you're doing as an affiliate owner and nothing to do with this podcast, just as an affiliate owner. Uh, cause bear had asked me, you know, before we did the pod, he's like, do you think it's a good idea? I was like, dude, anybody that's doing anything right now, it's a good idea. Like even if it falls short of whatever the expectation is, I think in a lot of these instances, it's literally just the effort and the goodwill that matters at this point. Uh, and obviously hopefully it works out, for um, sure. you know, but for me personally, you know, as the owner of CrossFit Rife, like thank you for what you guys are doing. I think it's really cool. And uh, at, at large from the community, thank you for what you're doing. I think it's really, I really, that. I think it's awesome for, um, you know, just to have a, uh, an ecosystem that is built on the backs of uh, folks like yourself. So thank you. Dude, every, every one of our employees can tell a similar story about how a CrossFit coach or a gym owner helped them navigate their own fitness journey, myself included, you know? And so we're, we're a team of CrossFitters. We, we, we can only relate to what you're going through. We, we, we get it and we understand there's a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty, but you better be sure we're going to do everything that we can to help. Well, listen, man, I don't think there's a better place to end than there. So guys, go check out O2, get your gym code, support your gym so that you guys can get back to it when this whole mess is over. And uh, if you guys got any questions, affiliate owners, reach out to Dave. And, uh, and I know his team is going to be more than happy to help you. So again, brother, thanks for your time. Thank you, man. Fun. Thanks for listening to Best Hour of Their Day. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast Let me explain. First of all, it's free. How cool is that? There's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so it becomes super simple. Some of these episodes with Fern or Todd or myself chatting with one another, we've done right within the app itself. Anchor will make it easy to distribute your podcast to all platforms, Spotify, Apple, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make an awesome podcast in one place. All you have to do 
is download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Come on, who doesn't have Spotify at this point? And if you were unaware, Spotify now is offering podcasts. That's right, on Spotify, you can listen to all your favorite artists, but also podcasts in one place for free. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the one you're listening to right now, best hour of their day. On Spotify, you can follow your favorite podcasts so you never miss an episode. Premium users can even download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are, something I always do before I hop on a plane. And you can even easily share what you're listening to with your friends on Instagram and other social media platforms. Here's the deal. If you haven't done so already, be sure to download the Spotify app, search for best hour of their day on Spotify, or browse some other podcasts if you want. You can find them in your library tab. And also make sure to follow me so you never miss an episode of best hour of their day. Thanks again for listening to Best Hour of Their Day, and thanks again to our special guest. We appreciate all you guys do for us with Best Hour of Their Day when it comes to sharing our posts on Instagram, when it comes to subscribing to us on YouTube, when it comes to the constant feedback. We are grateful and we appreciate it. We are trying to build a community based on coaching development and becoming the best version of yourself. And it goes without saying that we couldn't do without all of you. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Season one of Dropping In is out. We are getting tremendous feedback and we'd love for you to check it out. Leave us a comment on there. Head over to our Instagram. Give us a follow. Like our pictures. Feel free to share anything that resonates with you. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or feedback for us, please don't hesitate. Email us, besthouroftheirday at gmail.com. Thanks again. Until the next episode, we hope you've had the best hour of your day.